Okay, well, welcome back, folks. It's an absolutely gorgeous day here in Battlefield, Missouri. The sun's shining. It's about 60 degrees. Uh, so that means by tomorrow, it'll be about 10, and the wind will be blowing about 80 miles an hour. And maybe, who knows, snow or rain. It's been that kind of winter, hasn't it? Just a roller coaster effect. But that's typical of the Ozarks. I've always heard if you don't like the weather in the Ozarks, stay around in tomorrow. And, uh, you know, that's the, kind of the way it is. So we have been talking about the economic anchors of the old Ozarks. And we talked for quite a while about the railroad. The railroad by far and away was the most important of these uh, because it kind of gave birth to the Ozarks in a, in a lot of different ways. Uh, the second one that we talked about last week was the timber industry. And we talked about how it was so important because it was so easy to do if you were lived out in the woods, you could go out with an ax or a two-man uh, saw and saw down a tree and, and hack out about eight railroad ties a day and make about a dollar a day, which was, you know, pretty good money back in those days. You know, if you can make 20 bucks a month, you know, that would, uh, that was a uh, spending money, so to say. And it was, a uh, it, it was a way that a typical rural Ozarker could make some cash money. Well, there was a third thing that really was important in the Ozarks, and that was lead mining. In a way, that was the oldest of the anchors because it was lead mining that originally brought the first uh, Europeans to the Ozarks. And so let's kind of look at this a little bit. Uh, here's my Ozarker of note today. Uh, he wasn't an original Ozarker. He moved here from Virginia. But he is really, really important to the lead mining um, industry in the state of Missouri. You probably won't recognize him, but I know you most of you have heard his name. And if you haven't heard his name, I know most of you will recognize his son's name. That is Moses Austin. And of course, his son is Stephen Austin, uh, the young man that uh, is considered to be the father of Texas. Uh, Moses Austin was preparing to leave Missouri uh, to go down to Texas when he died and his son took over uh, from him and uh, eventually moved his whole operations to Texas and kind of became known as the father of Texas. But in the beginning, Moses Austin was a lead miner and he was a very good lead miner. Uh, he lived up in the area around Potosi, Missouri, on the very eastern part of the Ozarks where there was a lot of lead mines. And uh, he kind of revolutionized the lead mining industry in the Ozarks. He brought with it a lot of new technologies and made it into what it was in the early uh, 18th century in the Ozarks and later on into the early 19th century. Uh, so very important person. So uh, why do we want to study lead mining? Well, believe it or not, folks, lead is still a very, very important uh, item in this country. Uh, we don't think much about it. Everybody doesn't really pay much attention to lead anymore, but lead is still a very valuable mineral that is mined, and uh, as you'll see, it's a, it's a lot of it is mined here in the Ozarks. Uh, in the beginning, in the, uh, you know, like I said, it was the original catalyst for the settlement of the Ozarks, and the primary source of mineral wealth in the Ozarks was lead, and, and just look at the uses of it back in these days that we're talking about. Ammunition, uh, pewter. People made almost all their cookware out of pewter uh, until iron came around. Uh, paint and varnish. We all know that the original paints and varnish were very heavily uh, uh, contained lead, obviously not in a good way now. But back in these days, people just didn't understand that. Same way with pewter. They didn't understand that eating out of pewter cookware wasn't necessarily good for you, to say the least. Um, glass and glazes. We all know that if you've ever picked up a heavy piece of glass from the 19th century or early 20th century, and it's really, really heavy, it's probably because it contains a lot of lead. Uh, good glass is very heavily involved with lead. So, you know, we can see that lead was a very important mineral to this country. And again, uh, a lot of it came from the Ozarks. Now, obviously, 
we still use ammunition. It's still a very big deal, although there's not a lot of lead in modern ammunition. Uh, pewter is pretty much not gone anymore. We've uh, completely removed the lead. In fact, it's against the law to use lead uh, in paint and varnish. Glass and glazes, most of it has pretty much uh, eliminated the lead, except the very expensive glass. But there are a lot of modern uses for lead storage batteries. I mean, think about this, folks. All we hear about today is the removal of the uh, internal combustion engine and the uh, we're going to get rid of gasoline and uh, petroleum. And all we're going to do is be running electric cars. I mean, I've seen figures that say with another 20 years, you won't be able to buy a uh, a car with a internal combustion engine. It's all going to be electric. I mean, and it's all going to be used with storage batteries. Uh, so, you know, you know, you, you go buy a new battery. They're very heavy. That's because they contain a lot of lead. Lead is also used a lot in the protection against radioactivity and x-rays. And again, the medical field is a big use of the lead industry. Uh, petroleum agents, again, uh, they're kind of doing away with most of these, but, you know, for some time at least, and still to some degree, there are a lot of petroleum agents that use lead in the vehicle. So uh, lead has always been extremely important uh, to this country and still is. Uh, probably one of the biggest lead producing uh, plants in the United States is right here in the Joplin area, the Eagle Pitcher uh, Technology Corporation. They produce all the batteries for like the aerospace industry. Uh, every one of the satellites running up in the sky, uh, the spaceships that we send, the shuttles that all ran off of electrical power, all those batteries were made at the Eagle Pitcher Corporation. Uh, it's, a, it's really a huge uh, technological thing, and it's all located right here in the Ozarks. So let's kind of look at the lead mining regions and the lead mining period. There's about five of them. You can kind of trace lead mining through about five distinct periods. Uh, the first one occurred in what was called the mineral area, the old lead belt, and we'll talk about that. And then there was one called the tiff belt. Didn't last very long. It was up in the, up in the Lake of the Ozarks region and that kind of area. Uh, there was another one called the Iron Mountain Mining uh, District, Iron Mountain District, pardon me, uh, which had as much to do with iron as it did lead. The big one, the huge one, was the tri-state region that was located in the very southwestern corner of the Ozarks around uh, the uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Missouri area, uh, usually called the tri-state region. Uh, the center of it, of course, was Joplin. And uh, as we're going to see, that was, a, that was a huge lead mining region in the late 1800s, uh, clear up until the present time. The biggest lead mining region today has kind of gone back over into the area around the old mineral area. It's called the Viburnum Trend. Very modern, very technologically advanced. And we'll, we're going to look at each one of these real briefly. We're going to spend most of the time on the Tri-State Mountain, uh, Tri-State region, because that's the one that is so closely associated with the Ozarks. Uh, the primary lead ore that was mined in the Ozarks was something called Galena ore which is, by the way, the state mineral. Uh, here's a couple of pictures. One of them, the top one is galena, lead iron, and the bottom one is zinc. Zinc and lead are often found very close proximity to each other. And uh, where you find lead, you often find zinc, and both of them are very important minerals. I want you to notice something. Do you notice how shiny and silvery they look? That's the way that lead looks in its original way. Now, think about this. How many of you have lived in the Ozarks for most of your life or in any parts of it and have heard about the old legends? You know that there's all these old legends about lost silver mines in the Ozarks. I've got a feeling that where a lot of those lost silver mine legends came from was the fact that people found Galena lead iron, lead ore, and didn't realize that what they were finding was lead, thought they were finding silver. Silver, as I understand it, in its natural state, is not a shiny ore. It's kind of looks more like what we think 
of lead. It's kind of dull. It's kind of grayish. Um, that's the way I understand it. So it, you know, I think a lot of people probably just got mixed up when they were mining lead and thought they were mining silver, uh, or at least what you know they saw was lead and probably was silver. Here is a map uh, of the regions. This is the old lead belt over around Potosi, uh, Bon Terre, Missouri today, uh, Fredericktown, these areas through here, south of St. Louis. That's the original lead mining region of the Ozarks. And then it moved over kind of over in this area. Uh, that's called the TIF mining region and the iron mine, mining region. We'll talk about each one of those in a minute. This, of course, is the tri-state lead zinc lead zinc area. This is the big one that we know about. And then the most recent one, the one that's most active today, is this what they call the new lead belt, or over in around Viburnum, Missouri, called the Viburnum Trend. And uh, that's where a lot of the lead mining is going on today in this region right through here. So let's look at each one of these. The mineral area, as I've said, was the earliest. It was, it was the reason the first inhabitants came here uh, outside of the American Indian. Uh, they were looking for lead. Lead was that important. And several towns, once they found lead there, several towns were founded as a result of these mines. For instance, Bon Terre, Missouri, uh, used to be called Old Mines. Potosi used to be called Mine of Breton. Desloge, Missouri used to be called Mine of Joe. St. Michael's used to be called Fredericktown, and St. Genevieve has always been called St. Genevieve. But these were all lead mining towns in their origin. Um, these were towns that were basically formed because of the lead mining region. Uh, the modern era of lead mining after the 1700s began about 1864 with something called the St. Joseph Lead Company in 1864. And they began to mine all this area real heavily, particularly areas around Potosi and Bon Terre. Uh, this is one of those mines over, I think this is the one at Bon Terre. Uh, you can see, I mean, these were huge operations, folks. These were not just, you know, four or five man operations. These were gigantic. And they've just dug the lead out like crazy. Now, they were not very, very, very environmentally concerned. In fact, case they were probably not environmentally concerned at all. As a result, um, some of these places where the old lead regions was uh, are really almost basically toxic waste sites. Um, and there's been a lot of money and a lot of effort to clean these places up today. Um, you can still go and tour. Uh, there's a lead mine in Bon Terre that is actually like a state park. And you can actually go tour the uh, the area there and look through some of the, they show you how the old lead mines worked and all like this. You can walk through some of the old lead mines. I've never done that. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really have any desire to do it. Uh, but, you know, that's that excites some people, you know. Um, the second region was the Tiff Belt. This is the region that was up around the central part of the state, the northern part of the Ozarks, up around the Lake of the Ozarks today. Um, up around north of the uh, St. Francis Mountain, Madison counties, up around Washington County. Uh, the mines here were primarily, instead of lead, they were looking more for tiff, what we call barite. Uh, it's kind of associated with lead, and it's a soft, whitish gray mineral that is used for, for holding pressure in natural gas, gas dealing. It's also used in paint. It's used in ink and paper products, a lot of textile. They used a lot of it in asbestos when asbestos was being produced on a large level. Obviously, today, uh, it's not a, a mineral that we mine very much of, particularly the part where you made asbestos. Nobody uses asbestos anymore. In fact, the case uh, people spend millions of dollars a year to uh, remove asbestos. Uh, I used to teach for, I started teaching in the 70s. And uh, once I became an administrator for a while, one of my assigned duties was I was the asbestos person for the school district because there was a big movement where we had to remove 
or encapsulate all the asbestos in some of the older buildings. We didn't have a lot of it in the school that I lived, that I worked in. We were lucky. We only had a small amounts in one of the elementary schools. But nevertheless, it took a lot of money to remove this asbestos. And, um, you know, for the most part, you know, they've tried their best to get away with it. So for that reason, the old TIF belt kind of lost its, uh, its industrial use. Uh, this is kind of an area around the TIF belt. This is what a, a lot of these mines would have looked like. Lead mines, zinc mines, TIF mines, uh, iron ore mines. If you would have seen a lot of them back in the Ozarks in the 1800s, they would have looked just like this. Uh, two, three, four, five-man operations. Uh, they weren't big for the most part. And uh, you you can make a lot of money because, you know, this stuff was pretty expensive, pretty valuable. And you can see there, this one's got to have a steam engine operating a winch and a crane. And what they're doing is they're lowering a bucket down into the mine, and that bucket serves two purposes. It takes you down there to work and brings the lid up. I don't know about you, but that does not appeal to me in any way whatsoever. I'm, I'm kind of claustrophobic, and uh, to get into an area like that uh, kind of, uh, you know, doesn't appeal to me very much, to say the least. Dangerous job. Mining is one of the most dangerous jobs in America today. And still, there's still a lot of mining going on, but uh, it's still an extremely dangerous job today. The Iron Mountain, Mountain District uh, was just to the east a little bit around Iron County. Makes sense, right? Large deposits of iron ore were found here. Uh, there wasn't a lot of iron in the Ozarks, but there were some. Um, a lot of it wasn't your really good iron, uh, so they used it for things like wrought iron uh, to make, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, gates and stuff like this. I can't kind of lost my train of thought there. We all know uh, wrought iron is used for uh, decorative type things. Uh, the foundries uh, themselves were pretty large for a while. And uh, they really operated at a pretty high level. Pilot Knob, Ironton, Missouri, obviously, uh, was very involved. This is probably the biggest one of the iron mounds. And I believe this one is at Pilot Knob. So you can see it was, it was a pretty good operation. Uh, but there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of iron. It didn't take long to get the iron out of the ground. And so it didn't last a long time. This is the one we want to talk about for a while the tri-state region. Uh, in the post-Civil War era, they were looking for lead. Uh, the lead had started to kind of got harder to uh, take out of the ground over in this, the uh, eastern part of the Ozarks. And so they started looking at other regions and they found some huge iron and zinc deposits in the very southwestern tip of the state. Uh, and it became known as the Tri-State Region. Probably the first of these uh, was around the little town of Granby, Missouri. Granby is south of Joplin, kind of east of Joplin. And I know if you uh, if you go through Granby, I've been there a few times, uh, they still kind of pride themselves on being one of the first lead mines in the state and uh, in this region. And uh, it was a it was a, a boom town. These towns were basically really rough little communities because they attracted uh, mostly men and uh, they were mostly bachelors. And as a result, they were almost kind of like Wild West towns. You know, uh, they were really tough towns, uh, kind of like Chadwick we talked about in the railroad boom town. In 1871, uh, the Frisco Railroad got to Joplin, Missouri. Joplin only had a few houses. It was a hamlet. It wasn't even really a town. Within a few years, it had a population in the thousands because of the lead mining. And of course, Joplin went on to become the second largest city in the Ozarks. And for many, many decades, rivaled Springfield as kind of the, the city of note in the Ozarks. In fact, uh, I'd venture to say if you were to go out of the Ozarks and you start talking about where you live, and I've done this a lot, um, 
I would go places and they'd say, we're the, detect an accent. I don't think I have an accent. Obviously, I do. Uh, they would say, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm, I'm from Springfield, Missouri in the Ozarks. And they kind of look at you, kind of scratch their head like, I don't think I know where Springfield is. You know, you can tell they don't know. And so I say, well, you know where Bass Pro headquarters are located? Well, immediately, almost everybody wakes up. I mean, they, I, I, I've never been anywhere that I've mentioned Bass Pro <clears throat> that they don't understand then where I'm from. And then if I really want to make it in concrete, I say we're about 30 miles north of Branson. Everybody knows where Branson is. But surprisingly, a lot of them will say, oh, you're, uh, you're down around Joplin. Yeah, we're down around Joplin. Joplin is probably a third to a fourth the size of Springfield anymore, but it's still the town of note to a lot of people uh, outside of the Ozarks. Uh, it, it just has that kind of reputation. I'm not exactly for sure why. Uh, there's probably some reasons for it, but uh, for some reason, Joplin has always had kind of a more of a national image than has Springfield. Uh, for one thing, during much of its history, it was a much more uh, cosmopolitan type city than was Springfield. Springfield was kind of, I used to characterize it as an overgrown cow town. Um, it was just kind of like a big, big town uh, that had grown, outgrown itself. Joplin, on the other hand, you could go to Joplin and drive down the main streets and you would think you were in a big city, you know? They had almost what we call skyscrapers. They had really nice buildings um, on both sides of the street. And you just kind of feel like you're in a big city. I remember the, the first time as a young kid, I went to Joplin. And that was the impression I got. I'd been to Springfield lots. And I remember driving down the main street of Joplin where the Connor Hotel was and all these buildings. And I was thinking, man, I'm in a big city. <laughs> it really wasn't as big as Springfield. But it just looked like a bigger city. Unfortunately, uh, if you're familiar with the Ozarks, you know that a lot of that is gone now because of the devastating tornado that struck there several years back and just really uh, did a lot of damage to Joplin, uh, just really uh, altered the whole landscape of that community, really. Uh, just a really devastating event, to say the least. Uh, Joplin had a nickname. Uh, it was called the town that Jack built. There are stories. Jack, by the way, is a nickname for zinc. And there was, at the beginning, it seemed like there was more zinc than lead. Uh, there was a story that uh, zinc miners would go to the saloons in Joplin after working all day in the, in the zinc mines, the lead mines, bringing wheelbarrows full of zinc. And that's what they would pay for their drinks with, was zinc ore. Uh, they didn't have any money. All they had was zinc ore. And uh, the name kind of got started, and that's what it was known as for years, the town that Jack built. Um, this is a typical operation from Joplin. This is an area, this is one of the photographs from Joplin. There's tons of them about the mining in the Joplin region. And I like this one because it shows how just a man and his mule or his horse and maybe a partner, uh, if you had a lot of strong muscles and you had a man, uh, another guy to work with you and you had a horse or a mule, you could pretty well, you know, dig a lot of lead or zinc up out of the ground. Uh, dangerous job, you know, just at least. Most of these things, uh, these guys weren't engineers. They weren't, you know, they couldn't really understand the, the technology of the whole thing. They just understood that if they got down in the ground and dug out the ore, it was worth money. And that's all they cared about. Uh, so you can see that's a, that's an excellent picture. I just love that picture. It's a good photograph, and it really shows you how primitive these things operated in the beginning. This is prior to the steam engine days. Um, here's a large plant in the Joplin area. Uh, you can see that the chat piles uh, rock that after they separated the iron ore, they just leave the chat piles. You can still find these things all over the old lead mining towns. Uh, you go to the little town of Aurora to the west of here, about 20 miles, and go on the north side of Aurora, and it's still got trap piles uh, where they used to you know, extract the ore. And uh, 
fact, the case they, I know for many times they used them on motocross bikes. They actually made a motocross track there uh, going up and down the chat piles, you know. Um, this is the interior of a pretty large size mine. This is obviously a bigger operation than the one I just showed you a moment ago. Um, you know, together the uh, <clears throat> they're actually shored up and they've got the railroad ties, the little ties for the for the carts. Uh, a much bigger operation than what the other one was, the first one. So Joplin, within the turn of the century, around the 1900s, was really rivaling Springfield as kind of the business leader of Southwest Missouri. Uh, it wasn't quite as big as Springfield, but it, it had a lot more money. I'll be honest. It was a banking center. It was a transportation center. It was a commercial center compared to Springfield, which was more of an agricultural, educational, medical center. In fact, that's kind of the way it still is today, folks. Springfield's uh, big industry today are education. There's five universities or colleges in Springfield. It's a huge medical center uh, for the whole Southwest Missouri region and out. Uh, job, uh, you know, people in, uh, you know, Eastern Kansas, uh, North, uh, eastern Oklahoma, southern Arkansas, or northern Arkansas, a lot of people still come to Springfield for their serious medical attention. Uh, it's, it's got some really huge uh, medical centers. And so, you know, it's still kind of that way today. Um, Joplin was a pretty wild town. Uh, a lot of saloons, a lot of gambling parlors, a lot of brothels. Uh, it was just a really wide open town. Um, in fact, the case in the 1920s and 30s during the Prohibition days and during what is generally known as the uh, public enemy era, where you had people like Bonnie and Clyde and John Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd and these guys running around, a lot of these characters made their way to Joplin uh, for a reason. Joplin was kind of considered to be one of the four safe cities in America for the criminal element. One of them was Minneapolis, St. Paul. One of them was Kansas City. One was Hot Springs, Arkansas. And one of them was Joplin. Uh, it was kind of considered to be uh, an area where if you were a criminal and you went there and you kept your nose clean and made sure and check in and, and paid off the appropriate people that uh, you were kind of left alone as long as you'd left things alone. Now you can do crime in the city because if you did, you know, uh, you can do robberies and all that. You can do gambling, you can go to the brothels and saloons, but uh, you weren't supposed to do crime. That's why they were called safe cities. Um, but you know, we all know the story of Bonnie and Clyde. If you've been around the Ozarks for very long, you know that there was a big shootout in Joplin between Bonnie and Clyde and the law authority. That's because they didn't do the right thing. They didn't check in. They didn't do what they needed to be done. Uh, I have a story about this era. Um, I met my wife at a church camp. I went to a Bible Baptist church camp when I was a young teenager. And uh, my wife, I, I got worked there all summer. Uh, my The man that uh, was pastor of our church was involved with running the summer camp. And so he invited me to come along that summer, and I actually went down there and worked. And one of the jobs I did was they had a cave under the dormitory. And so I used to be a tour guide. And uh, I noticed this little skinny girl with glasses kept coming through the cave, and I kept thinking, man, she must really like caves. Obviously, I was a little naive because it wasn't the cage she was interested in. It was me. Long story short, uh, we started dating later and got married and been that way for 53 years. But the reason I tell you this story to begin with, uh, it's this old Bible church camp that still let, uh, still stands and still used today, Sagmont Church Camp. I mean, you may recognize the name. Uh, used to be an old gambling resort south of Joplin. Uh, that's because I asked, I started asking questions about it because I've always been interested in history and I was asking some of the pastors and what, how did this place get built to begin with? Because it was obviously built 
a lot earlier than what we were down there in the 50s and early 60s. And they were telling me the story how it used to be a gambling resort and uh, you know, just kind of off the radar. So no telling who lived in that place, you know, Al Capone, Bonnie and Clyde, who knows? Um, there were other cities besides Joplin that uh, sprung up as mining cities, and we all recognize their names. Webb City, Carterville, Carthage was a huge uh, mining city, only they tended to be more in the mining of limestone, as we'll see in a minute. Galena, Kansas. Galena, of course, was named after the Galena Ores, is Galena, Missouri. Baxter Springs, Pitcher was a huge uh, center of lead and zinc mining to the point that today Pitcher is pretty much a ghost town because it has uh, got so much toxic waste in it. Commerce, Oklahoma, hometown of uh, good old Mickey Mantle, one of my childhood heroes, whose father was a lead miner. Yeah, this is a picture of Joplin, Missouri, downtown Joplin, turn of the century. Folks, it just, you, you couldn't find pictures that look like this in Springfield. It just didn't exist. Uh, here's the Connor Hotel. This is obviously around in the 20s and 30s. The Connor Hotel doesn't stand anymore. I understand it was torn down a few years back um, and uh, to build up a new office building and all. But the Connor Hotel was huge. Uh, it was one of the biggest hotels in the Midwest and uh, was a, lux a luxury hotel. Um, this is the House of Lords. Uh, Kind of give you a story behind the House of Lords. Uh, this was a restaurant. People went in here to eat. The second story was the gambling den. After you got done eating, if you were interested, you went upstairs and gambled. The third floor was the brothel. Uh, everybody knew what the House of Lords was. It, uh, and I'm not for sure if that particular building still stands today. But uh, it was on Main Street, and it was just one of those things that everybody was aware of. The police authorities, the legal, everybody was aware of what was going on. They just turned their head because that was part of the whole mystery of Joplin, so to say. Um, huge houses. Here's one of the old houses that stood in Joplin. A lot of money in Joplin. A lot of money in Webb City and a lot of money in Carthage. Uh, these, these towns had a lot of money in them. Um, this is one of the old mines at Carterville, Missouri. Um, as far as I know, I never had too many relatives in the mining industry. Um, I did have on my grandmother Jane's side, her uh, father and grandfather came from the Carterville area. And I've got a feeling that at least one of them was involved in the lead mining area, but I'm, I don't know that for sure. Um, this is downtown Carthage, Missouri. Carthage was rich. Carthage, folks, if you want to see Victorian homes in the Ozarks, go to Carthage. Carthage is just loaded with old Victorian homes. They have done probably as good a job as any region, any city in the Ozarks of keeping their old flavor. Uh, I'm, I really enjoy going to Carthage. Here's, here's one of their old houses that's still standing today. You can see just a beautiful old home. Um, here's another one. And they're just, there's lots of these. I mean, there's not just two or three. We're talking dozens of these are still standing in Carthage. Beautiful home. Uh, here's a Italianate home, obviously. Uh, it's not maybe as big and majestic, but it has a really unusual flair for the Ozarks. So uh, there's just lots of these old houses standing around in Carthage today. Uh, as there are in, in Joplin and Webb City, not so many in Joplin anymore because I think a lot of them probably got damaged during the tornado. And Webb City has not been quite as interested, I believe, in preserving their heritage quite as much as has Carthage. Carthage has just really taken a, a strong interest in preserving uh, some of these old mansions. Now, Joplin's wealth began to spread uh, as the mine region grew and grew and grew and the railroads came in a lot of towns uh were built up as a result of these lead mining aurora missouri to the west of here i mentioned was a huge lead mining region as was pierce city a little town of galena missouri even republic today if you went to republic and said did you know there was an iron ore mine in republic 
right north of the Republic, most people would, would scratch their heads and say, what are you talking about? There's never been any mines in Republic. Well, there really was. There was an iron ore mine um, north of Republic. They were searching for lead and found iron ore instead. And uh, it didn't last very long, and it was never a big operation. But uh, every little town in southwest Missouri was the site of people looking for lead. Now, as electricity began to be more popular, the lead miners and the people that ran these mines realized, hey, instead of steam power, maybe I ought to use electricity to start running these things. The problem was it needed a lot of electricity. Result was that you begin to see the beginnings of the building of the dams in the Ozarks. If you come to the Ozarks today, particularly up at Lake of the Ozarks and down in the Shepherd of the Hills country on the White River, Branson, you're going to find dams all over the place. Uh, the White River, I think, has six dams across it. There may be more than that. I don't know. I know there's at least six major dams. Uh, there's only one big one at Lake of the Ozarks, but it's a huge one. That's Bagnell Dam. Um, there's also a couple smaller ones at Stockton, one at Warsaw, one at uh, uh, Pomme de Terre. Uh, so, you know, there's there's a really a lot of dams. These all came out of the lead mining, the needs for electricity. Uh, one of the companies in Joplin built the first one at a little place called Riverton, Kansas, across the border into Kansas. Uh, my brother-in-law used to work. He retired from Empire District Electric Company, which was the company that succeeded all these that built these dams. And he worked at the Riverton plant for a while. And then he actually went down and worked at the Power Site Dam at Foresight, which was the first dam that was built in the Ozarks uh, for the purpose of hydroelectric power. Uh, here's number one mine in Aurora, Missouri. Uh, you can see that this is kind of... This is Power Site Dam. This was the first dam that was built in the Ozarks to be built for the purposes of a concrete dam for hydroelectric power. And it dammed up the uh, White River and created what became known as Lake Taney Como. Uh, I'll tell you later on how Taney Como got its names. Uh, here's a picture about, this would have been taken probably uh, the dam was finished, I believe, in 1911, uh, maybe mistaken on that, might have been 13, but this would have been taken sometime in the night, early 1900s. Uh, people would go there to, for, to tour it. They thought it was a big deal to see the dam. The reason I know about the time frame this picture was taken, that's my grandma, Jane, that's two of her children, that's Bill and Anna, that's her sister, and that's my daddy. Uh, you can tell he was a he was a pest. Uh, he was a handful, even as a kid. Um, he was a handful as he got older, but he was definitely a handful as a kid. Uh, you can kind of tell that, I'm sure. Uh, so today, most of the lead mining in the Ozarks is done in the eastern part of the state again, uh, up around the area called Viburnum. The biggest mine is called the Doe Run Lead Mine. Uh, so that's uh, one of the bigger ones. There's much less environmentally intrusive than they used to be. They're, they're much more technologically operated. Uh, folks, Missouri is still an important lead mining region. Over 70% of the nation's lead supply comes from the Ozarks. A lot of people don't realize this. Over 200,000 tons of lead ore a year at a value of about a half a billion dollars a half a billion dollars uh, comes from there. Total income from all the mineral wealth in Missouri exceeding four and a half billion dollars a year. It's a huge operation in the state of Missouri and people just don't realize it. It's one of those things that people just don't pay attention to. Um, here's the Doe Run lead mine. As you can see, it's a very, uh, very modern, technologically run mine. There's not a lot of labor involved anymore. It's all done with machines, which is good. Uh, it's it, you know they they do everything they can to keep the environment clean. Uh, other mineral wealth in the Ozarks besides iron 
and lead was limestone, granite, zinc, as I mentioned, manganese, a little bit of coal, not a lot. Um, natural gas. There's one more thing I want to mention, then we're going to stop here. Just north of Springfield, northwest of Springfield, kind of around the area of Ash Grove, there's a little place called Phoenix. And Phoenix uh, used to be a really big town. Uh, now it's pretty much deserted. But it was the center of a lot of the limestone mining area. Uh, and a lot of limestone is very important in this for building purposes. You might not know it, but the state capital, Missouri, is clad in what they call Napoleon Gray marble, which is really limestone. And a lot of it was lime, was mined out of the Carthage, Phoenix area. Uh, and just recently, they just redid the state capital, spent a lot of money redoing the state capital. And uh, they had to go back and they wanted to make sure and match it. So well, what do you think they did? They reopened the Phoenix limestone quarry. And it's in operation today. And uh, it's, I understand it's doing pretty good business because a lot of people like to use limestone now for their countertops and things like this and uh, natural stone. And the result is it's actually doing a pretty remarkable business again. So they've started mining it. Springfield used to have a lot of limestone quarries. Uh, again, if you're familiar Springfield, you know there used to be three huge quarries around the Springfield area. There was one around the Kansas, and uh, I believe it was uh, the College Street area. There was a huge one uh, right off St. Louis Street uh, around National and St. Louis, which, of course, is the site today of the uh, baseball field, Hammond's baseball field. And then there was a really huge one, which is still there at Galloway, Missouri. They don't use it anymore except for a few things, but uh, there was a huge one at Galloway. So anyway, this is, uh, this is what we can say about the mining industry in the Ozarks. The next two weeks, we're going to go off on a different route. I've been talking about so far about the history of the Ozarks. We're going to do something different the next couple of weeks. I really hope you tune in because what we're going to be talking about is the way the people lived. We're going to look, I call it the day in the life, a day in the life of a typical Ozark pioneer. And uh, they were such a unique individual. And I've got lots of photographs and lots of pictures. And we're going to talk about superstitions. We're going to talk about uh, weddings and births and, and deaths the three big events which kind of dominated Ozark life. And uh, it's, it's a really interesting topic. I think you'll find it a, a great deal interesting. So I hope you tune in and listen, and we will see you next Monday at 2.30.